Hey everybody, how's everyone doing today? You having fun? What a great crowd and a beautiful day. On behalf of the Kentucky Book Fair, I want to welcome you. My name is M. Hendricks. I'm the author of The Chaperone, which is coming out next year. But I just have to tell you all, I could not be more excited to introduce two of my favorite people, two amazing Kentucky authors. First, I'm going to tell you about David Arnold. He's going to lead the conversation. And David Arnold, as you probably know, is a New York Times bestselling author. I'm sure you've all read his books like I have. He's written um, The Electric Kingdom, Mosquito Land, Kids of Appetite, and The Strange Fascinations of Noah Hypnotic. Please welcome to the stage David Arnold. And then, I mean, now I just can't even believe I'm doing this. I'm so excited to be introducing a Kentucky treasure, as you all know. I'm a Kentucky author too, so it's so exciting to be here with him. Today, David is joined by the author of six novels, a frequent contributor to the New York Times, and a former commentator for NPR's All Things Consider. He's a member of the Fellowship of Southern Writers, and today he'll be discussing his latest novel, Lark Ascending. Let's give a big Kentucky welcome to Silas House. Hey, buddy. Silas, how's it going, bud? <laughs> uh, before we get started, it's, I think it's a little bit warm in here, don't you think? It's pretty warm. It's kind of warm. Yeah. We should take... We're going to do a little strip tease. Good thing we have shirts on under here. Yeah, I know. It's a good thing. Yeah. And we have to change things, y'all. Yeah. We have to change things, or this book's going to come true. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I saw a shirt earlier that said, Kentucky is worth fighting for. Right. Couldn't agree more. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> so if you don't have plans, or if you do have plans next Tuesday, um, go vote. Right. Please go vote. It's really weird that we're wearing the same shirt. Anyway. <laughs> um, thanks, you guys, for having us. Um, I, I, Silas, it's such an honor for me to be able to talk to you. Um, I have the privilege of talking to you in private about books and about our lives, and um, this feels very much like that conversation, only with many more people listening in. So. And we, we usually have a cocktail. And so. we usually have cocktails. <laughs> <clears throat> hint, hint. <laughs> um, so yeah, this book is so beautiful, and I'm so excited to, to talk a little bit about it uh, with you today. So, Thank you. Yeah. I've been talking to you about it before it was a book, so... It's, yeah. So do you want to tell just a brief sort of synopsis about just briefly what the book is about um, yeah. for anyone who hasn't read it yet? Can you all hear in the back? Okay. Um, well, Lark Ascending is um, a man is on his deathbed in his 90s, and he's telling one of the main stories of his life when he was 20 years old uh, and the way that his family... Um, had to escape the United States because of the rise of fundamentalist insurrectionist and um, this sort of fueled by climate catastrophe. And so they end up on a refugee boat headed for Ireland. And once they get there, the lead character, Lark, is the only survivor of the ship. And he uh, joins forces with an abandoned dog and a mysterious woman, and they walk across Ireland aiming for a safe place together. So that's the plot, but it's a book that is about grief more than anything else. I wrote it, uh, I was in deep grief after losing my aunt, who was another parent for me. I, I feel like she was my third parent. I had very good mother and father, but I had a, I had a bonus parent in my aunt. And um, when I lost her, it just shattered me. And I... The only way I've ever survived anything is by writing through it. And so I just wrote my way through that grief by writing about a character in deep grief. At the same time, <clears throat> I felt part of that collective grief and that I think a whole lot of us have felt for years now that we've been losing our country. 
and that we, and also just all the sadnesses that we're exposed to all the time besides the demise of our democracy, um, witnessing school shootings and you know, one thing after another, just waves of sadness that have hit us for years and years. And um, so I was just writing about if things got worse, how bad could it be? But I wanted to find the light and the hope in it. So it's a book about the end of the world that's hopeful. It's a hopeful end of the world <laughs> scenario. Yeah, it, it definitely is that. I wanted to also talk about setting. Um, I sometimes feel like setting is the secret weapon of storytelling, and I know that your books are, are, are generally character-driven um, and just beautiful prose, but I wanted to talk about um, the role that setting plays in your books. Even with Southernmost, the setting is in the title, um, and it's so important and integral, an integral part of the story. Um, with this book, whether you're um, at the, the preserve in Maine or in the wilds of Ireland, I feel like setting was such a, a big part of a uh, propeller of the story. So I'd love to hear a little your thoughts on setting and, and then also how, how setting actually affects the character uh, and changes who the characters are. Well, when you come up as a Southern rider and a Kentucky rider, it's just, it's drilled into your head that you must deliver on sense of place. You know, it's just like such a huge part of our tradition. And I also think that we, especially Kentucky riders, we pay more attention to place because we're always having to defend our place. And so it makes us more aware of it. And even if we get frustrated with it, I think it makes us love it more and want, you know, and so it, it allows you to observe it more closely. <clears throat> and so my first books were deeply rooted in Eastern Kentucky, but as the books, you know, have expanded into other places that I love as well. I just, I always want to take the reader on a little trip. I want, when you pick up the book, I really want the rest of the world to fall away and that you're in Key West or you're in Ireland or wherever. That's what I want as a reader. And I always, I always just try to write the book that I want to read. And I just, <clears throat> and hope that other people will like something in it. And I, I do think a lot of people like to be transported somewhere when they read. They, you, wanna, you either want to go somewhere you're familiar with, like Eastern Kentucky, or you want to go somewhere that you know is not as familiar to you, like West Cork in Ireland. Yeah, and you spent some time in Ireland uh, as well, right? Like it's part of the research process for this book. And um, can you tell us a little bit about that trip and, and how that applied to the book, the writing of the book? Well, I said my aunt died and how, I mean, it was just like a total paradigm shift for me. Um, somebody told me once that you don't know anything until your parents are gone. And so, you know, I'm lucky that I have my mother and father, but I did lose one of those parents. And so it's just, you know, the day after her funeral, I had to get on a plane and go to Ireland because I had a commitment to the National University of Ireland at Galway to be a writer in residence, and um, it was too late to get out of it, you know, it was an unexpected death. And so, you know, it was really hard to leave my family and everything that reminded me of my aunt and go to Ireland, but it was also a real balm to be in Ireland and to, it felt kind of selfish to be removed from everything that reminded me of her at home. And, and the rest of my family, were, you know, they had to be right there in it. And so I was grieving alone, but also removed. Um, and so I just couldn't write this book and, and I couldn't separate it from Ireland. My grief and Ireland were tangled up and my um, recovery, you know, or search for that. Is this Lark Ascending beer? <laughs> Is this the Lark Ascending? Oh, I'm glad, I didn't know they had it today. Thank you so much. Cheers, brother. <laughs> this beer is called Lark Ascending. It's, it's to commemorate the book. And it's a, a blonde ale with notes of, what is it? Juniper and, no? Black currants. Black currants, okay. Yes. And so Country Boy did that. Just a hint. Just a, to like celebrate a hint. the book. So get one, and then maybe they'll keep having it. Because I love ordering it when I'm out somewhere. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. You have a beer named after you. That's amazing. <laughs> Um, I feel like when I'm reading a book with a dog, I can always tell if the author loved a dog. I know that you've loved at least one. So talk about the dogs that you've loved in your life and Seamus' character. Yeah. Um, I can't ever remember a time in my life when I didn't have a dog. Like, never. I've always had a dog. And I've been lucky that most of those dogs, you know, lived good long lives. So I've had like four dogs my whole life, you know. And... Um, the older I get, the more attached I become to dogs because the less people I like, <laughs> the older I get. It's like the older you get, the smaller your circle becomes, you know, and because you're realizing more what's important, you know, and so, and especially I think a lot of us during the pandemic, our animals became even more important, you know, we were with them more and et cetera. Um, the main thing is when I was in Ireland, some of you have probably heard me tell this, but I was, I was always walking on these long walks. And at one point, this little sheepdog joined me for a while. And um, once I started writing this book, I couldn't stop thinking about that little dog. But I don't know, I don't, I've never had a sheepdog. And so I had to do all kinds of research on sheepdogs. And um, I was grilling a good friend of mine about sheepdogs. You know, she has, she had two sheepdogs at the time, and I was just asking her the most minute details. And so finally, she said, "Well, you know, you have a perfectly good beagle at your disposal <laughs> that you could just study him." But I, in my mind, there weren't beagles in Ireland. Like I don't think of beagles in Ireland. So one of my best friends is from Ireland, and I called her, and I said, "You know, growing up in." Ireland, were you familiar with beagles? And she's, oh, we had loads of beagles. And so that gave me permission. Do you have an Irish accent you can hit us with? Did she? Do you have an Irish accent that you can? I'm really bad at that. No. Okay, all right. We'll just move every, on. Every kind of accent I try to put on, it's like an Appalachian putting on an accent. <laughs> like, I, I, I wanted to learn Spanish so badly, and in college, I would speak during the classes, and everybody would be, you know, like, make fun of me. Because I would say that Jorge, you know, or whatever. <laughs> and so pulling off of, yeah, I can't do it. Nor can I, so <laughs> yeah. Um, well, on that note, I would love for you to read a very short passage. Um, this was my favorite passage in the book. I felt like it encapsulated so many things. Um, so I, I will have a question for you, but I would love for you to just read this paragraph before I ask it. Okay. To taste and be tasted, every part of us humming and alive. If you are very lucky, it happens occasionally that your body fits with someone else's in such a way that you feel you are not two separate people, but one being, that you've gone beyond the physical, to know each other by heart, to sit and be silent with someone else, to feel as if you are alone, yet with someone, to feel safe. Uh, yes, that's... Why do you like that? Why do I like it? Uh, to me, it felt like the running theme throughout the book. You mentioned before that, you know, it's set in this rather bleak uh, backdrop, um, but it is feel, filled with so much hope, and I got to thinking about that, and whether you're talking about Lark and his mom or Lark and Seamus, and, and most of all, Lark and Arlo... I felt like those relationships and the love that he has with those characters is, is what brings him through, but then us as readers, it also gives us the hope to continue reading as well. So I'd love to hear about those relationships, specifically Lark and Arlo, which is such a beautiful story. Well, you're right. I, the book is a lot about the desire to feel safe, you know? And um, <clears throat> I think that's something that for a, a long, a, a long, period in my life, I didn't feel safe. Um, and I think that he is, you know, he's on the run from these fundamentalists. His existence has been outlawed as a gay man. And so he is hiding out in the, up on a mountain with another family. And um, so he's able to have this love affair removed from all of the violence that's going on down, you know, below the mountain. So it's 
gay love stories are always set up set against a uh, background of violence and prejudice and hatred and exclusion and so I wanted to create a scenario where that that wasn't like that you know where it was they were able to have a relationship like anybody can have because they're surrounded by people who accept them for who they are of course the world catches up with them you know so um, eventually that all collapses but for two years they um, they get to be who they are and I just I wanted to write that kind of tender love story you know and it was somewhat inspired by the graphic novel and the movie V for Vendetta which has this beautiful section in it um, where this couple you know is they're able to be together for so many years and then you know the regime drags them off to a concentration camp because they're a gay couple and in Envy for Vendetta, she says, you know, for seven years I had roses every day, and then it's all taken away. Yeah. Does that make sense? No, absolutely. Yeah. And I, can, I also can't help, <laughs> I can't help connecting the dots to uh, how we started this discussion with these shirts, and I feel like the idea of feeling safe, uh, no matter who you are, and um, that is so prevalent today right. still. Yeah, somebody told me the other day, why do gay people always have to make being gay political? And I'm like, we're not the ones that made it political. <laughs> you know? <laughs> well, it was the other people that made it political. Like, we're just living our damn lives, you know? Yeah. So I have this um, theory, which I've discussed with you before, um, about uh, the way that writers read, um, which is something that I realized about myself that... Um, as I'm reading, I realize there are certain things that I value. And I think as readers, there are things that we all look for in the books that we love. Here's the thing that I really look for. I love a strong voice, or I love a quick plot, or I love you know, a romance, or I love whatever. And that's each of us have a hierarchy of values in the books that we read. And I've realized as a writer, the more that I do this, the more that those values seep their way into my writing. It's not a coincidence that the things that I fill myself with then are the things that come out of me. Um, for instance, I love to read a book that meanders. Uh, I love to read a really strong character, no matter how unlikable they may be. Um, so I'm curious what your hierarchy of values may be, and I don't have to get the whole list here, but maybe just a couple of the yeah. ones that are the most important. For me, language is the main one. You know, I want to read a book that, in which the author has worried over the sentence. Now, some, some really fun books are out there that I enjoy reading that I can't, I can't ever totally love them because the author hasn't worried over the sentence enough, you know? And I sort of want to luxuriate in the language when I'm reading a novel. This gives me the opportunity to name a couple that I've read recently that I want to recommend. I just finished Cloud Cuckoo Land by Anthony Doerr. Oh my God, that is such the a brilliant The scope novel. of that book is just Gee, outstanding. It is I mean, one of the best I mean, books I've ever read. It, it ripped my heart out and like held it out in front of me and squeezed it. <laughs> I mean, it didn't just break my heart, it tore my heart out, but I loved it. The other book is sort of the opposite because Cloud Cuckoo Land is like 600 pages. The other book is 100 pages, somewhere in there. It's called Small Things Like These by Claire Keegan. Anybody read that? Masterpiece, yes. Get the, neither of those authors are here, so I should be, I don't know, um, doing something. Get the Electric Kingdom <laughs> by David Arnold. Get, you, it's, it's funny though, because early on, not to, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, but early on in the process of us both writing um, these books, I asked you, well, what's your, what's your piece about? And, and he said, well, it's about this this character who walks for a really long period of time through the, through the woods with a dog. And, and then you said, so what's yours about? And I said, well, it's about this character who walks for a really long time through the woods with a dog. We were so afraid they were similar, <laughs> yeah. but they're, they're, they're not. very different. Yeah, yeah. they're very, yeah. There are dogs though. We <clears throat> love dogs. Right, right. And I have to say, because so many people are asking me this, the dog does not get killed. So you can read the book. <laughs> Okay, um, so there's a website for that too. It's called like, doesthedogdie.com, I think. Um, 
Now, this book does take place over 90 years, and we know dogs don't live that long, unfortunately. But the dog is not killed. That's a big difference. My dog lives the entirety of the book, Silas. <laughs> right, well, you have a trick there. <laughs> Um, I wanted to ask one more question, and then we're going to open it up for, from, uh, for the questions from the audience. But um, I wanted to ask if you, and this is actually something we have not just talked about before. I feel very strongly that in books, and I would, I would argue probably throughout all of the arts, that kids, having kids in your life as a creator of art is a boon. It actually helps. Um, Yes, you have to sacrifice more time. You don't have as much time when you have kids. Um, I was in music for a long time, and I was around a lot of people who were waiting to have kids until, you know, whatever goal they set for themselves. And I just feel very strongly that kids actually help you create the thing. So I wondered if you wanted to talk a little bit about the role that your kids have played in your uh, role as a creator. Well, first of all, when my kids were little, when my first books came out, you know, a lot of times at a, during an interview, the journalist will say, is there anything I haven't asked you that you want to talk about? And I would always say, well, I wish you would ask me what it's like to be a father and a writer because people only ask women that. They only ask, how do you balance being a mother and a writer? They don't ask a father that. And I mean, you and I are both really hands-on fathers. And I wrote my first three books with a youngin in my lap, you know, pretty much, or crawling on me or something. And um, I really did. And um, you're right. I mean, it fed the novel for me every time. And also, I mean, like this book, for instance, a lot of it I was writing sort of to, I, I mean, I wasn't feeling particularly mortal or anything, but I was thinking, I want to put things in this book that my children will fish out someday, you know? And um, when you're spending years on a novel, you find any way you can to sustain yourself, you know, so doing that is one thing that I do. Um, you know, you want to make your kids proud. And so I think I'm thinking of that when I write, and I'm real conscious of that. Yeah, I do feel that it adds a sense of urgency to, to making sure that what you're doing counts and matters. And I don't know if it's the mortality thing when you have kids, there, it, you are suddenly, or I was suddenly more aware of my own and uh, making sure that I'm doing something that, that is of value and yeah. that is important. Yours is still little. They, they will hold you to higher standards the older they get, too. <laughs> yes. It never gets easier. It just changes shape. <laughs> That's a great Silas quote, guys. <laughs> Parenting never gets easier. It just changes shape. <laughs> Silas House. Um, Yes, uh, so we can take some questions. If this is uh, a, from yeah, if this is a good spot, would you like to take some questions? Or if sure. you guys want to continue, I bet you there are a lot of people out here who have something they want to ask, though. So, folks, if you'll do me a favor, raise your hand. We'll bring a microphone to you. Don't be shy. We'll get in as many questions as we have. Over here. All right, so we've got one over here. I'm going to start over this way. If you have a question over here, Monica is going to help me out. So. I'm coming. While you're doing that, I want to say I was paraphrasing Alison Moyer right there because she says grief never goes away. It just changes shape. So I was applying that. Oh, okay, to so it's not Silas House. Right, yeah, don't right. quote Silas. I don't want to take credit. Yeah. Hi. So my question is for you, Silas. So in the book, there was a piece that was particularly striking to me about the advice that is important in your life, which is keep moving and be still. Yeah and that Lark and Seamus both seem to understand that. I was just wondering what your inspiration was or where you kind of came to that. Is that something that you use in your own life? Well, I was thinking so much about survival skills. You know, the, the, the characters are trying to stay alive and they're doing everything in their power. You know, they're foraging for their food and um, sometimes, you know, he goes for long stretches without fresh water and, you know, things like that. So I was just thinking about if I was, I was always putting myself in that situation. And I was also thinking about grief. And I thought a lot about how, for me, one way I worked through my grief was that I was, I got busy. I had to be real busy. Now, a lot of people in my life, the way they deal with the grief was they had to sit down and be still. And I saw how both of those things work. You know, to be still works for some people. 
and to get moving works for some people. And for me, sometimes one of those things work and sometimes the other does, you know. So it just made a lot of sense to me. I really like that little passage in the book. Um, before we move on to any questions, I will just uh, ask if, uh, to, if, if, if to not give away the major plot points in the book, because sometimes that happens during Q&A, so I just have to ask. For everybody else, you know, it's a benefit. Yeah. Well, I have not yet read the book, so I won't have that problem. Um, but my family is from Harlan County, and so I feel very strongly about Appalachian culture and them being represented in a way that is not stereotypical. Um, and I was wondering if you could give some information on about, you know, things that you've read that are positive Appalachian or if you've written something that is kind of helps give a, our culture a more positive view. Well, I mean, as a writer, I, what I try to do is I just want to tell the complex. What I'm aiming for is the complexity. I, I think that it's just as harmful to romanticize as it is to vilify. And so I don't ever want to do either. I just want to tell the truth of the, the little bit of Appalachia I know. That, it's a hard thing to do because, you know, one person will think that a writer is breaking stereotypes and other people will think the same writer is perpetuating them. So to some degree, it's just about the reader and the way they feel about those things, you know. Um, for instance, in my first novel, there's a, a storyline about domestic violence. Well, some people were really upset about that when the book came out, and they said that I was perpetuating the stereotype of the violent Appalachian man. My response was I was writing about human beings, and domestic violence happens. And just because my book is set in a place that's stereotyped for that, I can't leave those things out of the narrative, you know? So <clears throat> I think it's a lot of it is about <clears throat> the intent of the writer shows through pretty easily. When you're reading a writer and the writer is being condescending, it's pretty easy. It's like your antenna, you have your antenna up and you know, you know? So I think you can explore those problematic parts of human beings in a particular place, but it's the way you do it and just showing the complex. So what I'm saying is look for the complex writers, you know. I think literature owes itself much more to complexity than, than visual media tends to sometimes um, because, you know, in a novel, you have about 300 pages or so to explore that complexity <clears throat> in a way that sometimes TV shows and movies and whatever has to home in on one little detail, you know? So it, it's a difficult thing. The only book that I know right now, you know, that I warn people away from is the, the book that we all know about and that we won't say its name and it's fueled a terrible political career too. So, um, you know, that's the only book I've ever spoken publicly about in a negative way. I just think, you know, I would never publicly say that book's bad or not, except for that book. Yeah. It's bad, just to be clear. David, while we're looking for another question, if you have, do we have one up front? Great, okay, great. Hang on. Easy question. I couldn't get my pen and paper out quickly enough to um, write the names of the two books you referred to earlier, your two most recent reads, and so could you just repeat that? <laughs> Cloud Cuckoo Land. The Anthony, Anthony Dorr. Yeah, D-O-E-R-R -R is his last name. The other one is Small Things Like These. Claire Keegan, K-E-E-G-A-N. They have both of those books here at Joseph Beth. Great, so we have another question. This is an easy one, I think, for both of you. But how old are the kids, and do they read the books? And at what age are you ready for your kids to read your books? I, my kids are 23 and 27. They've always had a book, you know, put before them. However, I did learn early on that one way to get my children to read 
was to give them books about stuff that they cared about and not just try to make them read the books I wanted them to read. And I think sometimes we do that where we'll just push certain books on them. You got to let them read what they want to, you know. Um, and so I'm, I'm really proud of the way their reading has evolved on their own. What about you, David? Yeah, it's about creating the space and the opportunity. It's not about prescription. Um, and so my kid is 10 and he loves graphic novels, so we do a ton of graphic novels. Um, and he has, re he may be here. I don't, I don't know if he is or not. Wingate, are you here? No, he's not here. Okay. Um, he, that has only recently turned into reading novels, not graphic novels. But again, it was not a prescription. It was, it had to be his idea, as a, in many things. A big things. part of it is reading together, too, don't For you sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. Ever gotten to sit down during a Q&A, but there was a seat here. This nice lady behind me has a question. So you went to Ireland after your aunt's death. Were you? Did you find her in Ireland with you in different places? And if so, where, do you know what I'm saying? Her yeah. spirit, where, where did you find oh, her? Oh, yeah, I mean, you know, it, it was the kind of relationship where I think of her every day, and she, uh, she's with me all the time and has influenced everything in my life. Yeah. And I think one thing when I was in Ireland, I, right after her death, I kept seeing it through her eyes and thinking about how she never got to really travel. So I was thinking a lot about that, you know, because like, I'm the first generation in my family to really get to travel. Um, when I was growing up, you know, we went to Gatlinburg, and that's it. You went to the lake or you went to Gatlinburg, and that was as far away as you went. They didn't want to get outside. They didn't want the hills out of their sight, you know. So, um, yeah. Anybody else? Well, you did get three snaps up back here for Gatlinburg, for what it's worth. There's somebody back yeah. here. Dollywood, I love Dollywood. I got to go to Dollywood once every year at least. I used to be a season ticket holder when, I, my, when my kids were little. I know we're focused on Lark Ascending today, but can you talk, both of you talk about what's upcoming for you? What's in the, ahead, what's in the offing? So I have a book called I Loved You in Another Life that's coming out next fall. Um, it's about two, two strangers who start hearing songs out of thin air um, and those songs have geographically specific locations in them. And so it, uh, they start to follow the songs and it leads them to each other. Uh, uh, but then they start to think that m they feel that maybe they've fallen in love uh, many lives prior. So it's kind of a reincarnation uh, love story. And I wrote the songs that they hear and I'm recording those right now and we'll uh, be releasing the songs with, with the book next, next fall. I can't, I can't wait for that. Um, I love David's books so much. Um, I, I f have already finished another novel, and um, it's set in the 1950s in Appalachia, and that's really all I can say about it. Um, and I, I loved writing it. And, um, and I have another book in my head, but I'm trying to take a break. I have been working on a novel since about 1997, and I just need to not be working on a novel for a little while. But I'm fighting against it. Like, I'm always wanting to think about, you know, another one. It, um, so I'm trying to take a break. Breaks are important. Yeah. I have a question right over here. I'm right here, Silas. Uh, I, I really enjoy your books. They're very wonderful books. I, but I wanted to ask, is there a story that you've always wanted to write, but you just felt that it's not time to write it yet? Yeah, I, I have always wanted to write a sort of Civil War epic. And I know I want it to be set at Cumberland Gap, you know, which was Cumberland Gap was occupied the entirety of the war and was a really important place during the Civil War and just explore all the complexities of, of that time. And, Kentucky and Tennessee, and I'm not ready for that amount of research yet. I also want to write a memoir about when I was growing up, my neighbors were brutally murdered, and the way that that changed our whole town and my whole childhood, and um, I, w I want to write a memoir about that eventually, too. Yeah. I have another question here. This nice young lady's been hiding behind the mugs and the keychains, so I'm going to let her ask her question right here. Hi, this question is for both of you. 
Um, when you're writing, how much do you write a day? And do you plot things out, or are you sort of write by the seat of your pants? Go. Um, I would, uh, have many author friends who r have a word count goal. I tried that early on and realized I was writing awful words just to meet it, like just for the sake of meeting. I'm, I'm a very type A, goal-oriented person, but in some respects, I'm the opposite when it comes to my work because it just, I end up writing stuff that I, it just isn't any good. So I kind of ditched the idea of a word count goal. I do write every day. Um, only because it's, I'm lucky enough for it to be my job now. So if I didn't, <laughs> um, you know, it's kind of like, what am I going to do? I, I, I take that back. I, there, are, there are some parts where you take a break and then it's a lot of reading, but I kind of count that as part of my job. But I will say with the first novel, that was, uh, I, actually, I'd love to hear your story about this, but with my first novel, you know, before it had been published and before I had any readers or anything, um, I was taking care of our then infant baby. Um, and trying to figure out how to write and be a stay-at-home dad of a baby at the same time. And it's about, it's kind of about letting yourself off the hook. So I would, I would sleep when he slept, or I would write when he slept. And if I slept when he slept, then I would stay up late that night and write. So you kind of make goals with yourself. Also, the YMCA has free childcare. You can't leave the premises, but they don't make you work out. So you can drop your kid off as I did many times, and then sit in the lobby and write. So I have a hard time with people who are like, I'd love to write a book if only I had the time. I'm like, man, you can, you can find the time. So I went on a big tangent there, so I don't even remember the question. <laughs> Silas, you can... What was the question? Well, uh, how do you write process. every day? I write in my head all the time, and it's really... I don't put my fingers on the keyboard much until I have the whole book formulated. But I think, you know, you have to learn how to write when you're waiting in the pickup line at school or you're in the grocery store or, you know, I'm just, I'm, I just always think no time is wasted as a writer because I'm always writing in my head. And I'm disorganized about everything in my life. Like I never know where my keys or my phone or anything is but I'm very organized about my writing and where, you know, I remember everything that I formulated in my head and I get it down on paper at some point. Um, but I feel more like a juggler than a writer. You know, like right now, I'm on a 26 city book tour. I'm teaching at Berea College and I'm, I'm writing other things. Like I'm writing, right now I'm writing three things for magazines, you know, and just, and then you have your, your real life that you have to do, like take care of the art or whatever, right? And um, so it's just a juggling act, I think. And to me, that's the key to really becoming a writer. A, mo a contemporary writer is learning how to juggle that stuff. Yeah, and the great, the great thing about the answer to your question is that there is no answer. Right. It's, you got to find just your heard, own way. Right, you heard yeah. two very different responses yeah. because it's about figuring out what works for you. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we have a question here. Thank you. Um, this is for both of you. If you were not a writer, what would you be? Penniless. <laughs> yeah, broke mu a broke musician. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, a broke musician. I would like to be mine. a musician. Yeah, I'm just, if I, if I could have had any job, I would have liked to have done that. I never had a backup plan. You know, from from the time I was in seventh grade, I was determined to be a writer, and that's all I ever aimed for. When you went to a rural public school like I did, and you said, I want to be a writer, they would send you to journalism. And so I became, you know, a journalist. And um, I'm really thankful for that now, because like I said, I'm an, I identify really strongly as a novelist. One of the first things they ask you to do when you have a novel coming out is write a bunch of essays for them to farm out to, you know, newspapers and magazines to promote the book. And having that journalistic training allows me, you know, it's a lot easier for me to do that. Um, and by the way, I have to say, say I'll embarrass my, my first college journalism teachers here, Susie Bullock. And um, so I, I'm so indebted to Professor Bullock and, and how patient she was and and how, how, what a great teacher she was. So thank, can we give her a hand for being a great teacher? <laughs> That's me. 
And my seventh grade teacher was here today, too. And so um, <clears throat> if any of you saw me like in tears and in the floor downstairs, it's because my seventh grade teacher came and I hadn't seen her for a while. She is the reason I'm a writer because she was the only person in my life when I was, you know, how old are you when you're in seventh grade, 11 or 12? 12. Yeah, I was like a 12 year old little boy in a small rural town who wanted to be a writer. <laughs> The only example I had of that was John Boy Walton. He's the only other boy I knew who wanted to be a writer, and he wasn't real, you know. And Miss Stidham told me that I could be that, you know, and that literature was important and all that. So I'm so indebted to my teachers. So it's wonderful to see two of them today. I have time for two more questions. I'm back here in the back. Well, we got Oh, you have one back there. I've got there. one okay, right sure. where I am. Okay, hang tight. Good afternoon. This is for Silas. You premiered the hurting part at the University of Kentucky for the first time back in the early 2000s. My son was one of the characters in your play. And his question and mine, with all that stuff rolling around your head, what other plays might you have up there? <laughs> well, who did he play? The younger main character. Oh, yeah. I, lo I loved the, I, that whole cast was special, a really special cast. I have been working for years on a play about Mary Todd Lincoln, Elizabeth Keckley, and Mary Todd Lincoln's sister, Emily Helm. And um, it's about the two weeks when Mary Todd Lincoln's Confederate sister lived in the White House. And I'm just about to wrangle it. Um, and, and hopefully I'll, I'll finish that eventually. Um, I love playwriting, and I never would have done that if the University of Kentucky hadn't commissioned me to write. They asked me to write a Christmas play, which is the hardest thing in the world to do, to write a Christmas play. Like, how do you write that without being corny, you know? And so my Christmas play is all about grief and homesickness. That's how I got around it. It's a really depressing play, but, um, but it worked out, so. Um, I was going to say, I hope you get, this is my rector, so I really want to hear his question. <laughs> Silas, David, it's great to be with you guys this morning, or this afternoon. Silas, I just finished reading Qu Clay's Quilt, and one of the things that was just awesome, thank you for that, putting that book out in the world. So this is kind of a, a craft question. Um, one of the things I really appreciate that, that you do is you bring us into bedrooms, you bring us into living rooms, you bring us onto front porches, you show us roof lines. Um, this morning, Wendell Berry said, for writers, attention to the particular actually informs a universal experience. We can all be there on the front porch. So I'm, I'm curious about your craft. Like, is there a collection of porches and bedrooms and living rooms and, and homes and, and yards in your, in your mind that you draw on from, I don't know, childhood or, or, or wherever? Where, where do you get all of your space? Does that, does that make sense at yeah, all? I love that question. I mean, it's a hard thing to articulate, but I... I do operate by Shakespeare, I believe it was Shakespeare who said that all of life's little dramas happen in the bedroom, meaning they happen in the kitchen, on the porch, you know, their, their ordin ordinary, ordinary life is extraordinary. And that's what I really want to focus on, like the, extraordinary, the extraordinary nature of just everyday life and everyday people. They're the most interesting people, you know. A question that writers get a lot, especially if you're working with uh, young adult literature, is who are your heroes? And my heroes are always like the people you've never heard of, you know, the people who are never in the news or are not in the history books. They're the ones that really, really make the difference, you know? And um, I, I always have a physical map in mind when I'm working on a book, and so I'll have a map of the whole community but then I'll also have a map of the house that the people live in. And I mean, I might not draw it out, but it's in my mind. And I always really, I need to be able to move around in a physical space when I'm working on a book. And I, so I need to picture that so that you can get to it as the reader. Do you do that? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah, you kind of play out the, almost like a, a movie in your mind mm -hmm. and, um, and then you have sort of that sandbox to work inside of yeah. then at that point. Right, right, yeah. Is that all? Do we have one more? Well, it's, 
I just have to say it's been one of the great pleasures of my life to be up here with one of my heroes. And uh -huh. such a, uh, I just feel so fortunate to be able to call you a friend uh, and celebrate too. this book with you. You and, too. Um, I'm so glad to Everybody buy Lark Ascending if you haven't already. Yeah, buy Ladies. Electric Kingdom. They go really well together. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. Let's give it up for Silas House and David thank Arnold. You. Thank you all so much. Thank you.